What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. Welcome back, Nightmare Success in and out listeners. Wow, do I have a treat today. I know you guys come here for what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. Well, Alec Berlikoff is my guest, and he is, um, it's a fascinating story. I was just watching another podcast. Uh, uh, Justin Paperni actually turned me on to Alec, and uh, it's, I mean, you could make a movie out of it, and they basically are, but... Uh, this is a, a school guidance counselor that then turns into someone who generates over $3 billion worth of pharmaceutical sales in the d- drug industry. Uh, Alec was a senior VP at INSA Pharmaceuticals. Uh, you may have seen him on 60 Minutes. Uh, you may have read his book, Selling Hard Lessons Learned. Uh, there's a Netflix movie coming out in October, Pain Hustlers, about Alec and the fall of this billion-dollar company. And he helped actually contribute onto that movie. Um, in the end of all this, this story, uh, there was the founder and six other executives that uh, were convicted in a very unique um, case. It's not really happened the way that this happened, reaching into the C-suite and pulling people out and putting them in prison. Uh, and the other interesting thing is, is Alec and I were just talking about this before he got on. Um he did his time while COVID was going on. And I just find that incredibly interesting because there's only so many different types of things that are uh, certain freedoms you have in prison. And when they take those away, it gets really small. I can't wait to unpack all this with this fascinating story with Alec. Uh, before we do that, I want to recognize our sponsor, Auto Plaza Direct. You know, who likes spending a couple of weekends walking the lots, car lots? looking for a car. Then you spend four or five hours at the dealership to buy a car. It's kind of like a trip to the dentist. Well, there's a better way to take care of all the pain and hassle of getting a car. It's called Auto Plaza Direct. They are your personal car concierge. They just uh, You just tell them the car you want, what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price and deliver the car to you. They'll also offer you warranties and finance, all for ser- full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge, the new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Alec, how are you doing? I'm well. How about you, Brent? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for uh, making the time to do this, Alec. I I find your story absolutely fascinating because, you know, and and there there's so many different layers to this because you – your your dad and your and your uh, brother were in the sales business, and you weren't. You went a totally opposite direction. You 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 went into child psychology. You got a master's in that. Then you became a guidance counselor. And as the story goes, you were like, "Man, I I want to I want to catch up with dollars. I want to you know get into something that that can be something that I can relate." To back to what everybody else is doing and he got into this big world but it's not too far out of the realm because you had been in a competitive guy all your life you you wasn't sure. like all of a sudden you t- you put on the superman robe and and said okay I'm I'm Alex Berlikoff and I, now I'm taking off you you've you were kind of already had it in your DNA you just decided I'm I'm taking off and then when you took off, which is interesting, Alec, is you became, um, I think it was the rookie of the year with uh, Eli Lilly right off the bat, which I had to be incredibly, um, I don't know, I would have been pretty enthusiastic about that if that was the new, new career I was going into. So going back into this, just, to, I mean, just sprinkling a little bit of that, take us back to growing up as a kid. What was it like to be in Alec's life growing up? Um, I mean, I grew up, you know, with mom and dad. 
Um, they got divorced when I was in college, so I had I had mom and dad at home. Uh, for you know, for my elementary school years, my mom was a full time stay at home mom. Uh, my dad was a workaholic. Uh, I had an older brother who had uh, some very very severe bipolar disorder and uh, passed away in 2013. Mm. Um, but you know, he and my he and my brother and I were close, and we uh, you know we did what most kids did. We hung out, we played stickball, we played basketball, uh, any other game that we could figure out. Um, obviously we weren't, uh, we weren't, I try to say not home. You know, I didn't like to be home. Didn't like to have friends over, you know, yeah. it was, I had, listen, I didn't have a bad life, but you know, there was always yelling and screaming and fighting, you know, my parents didn't have a good marriage and with my brother's mental illness, there was stress in the family. But, um, you know, I think you, you think you talk openly enough to enough people and you realize that that's pretty much. In it happens. Family. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so one of the things I thought was interesting, you had sports and different things going on in your world. Uh, I think your dad was a big part of that in your world too. Um, but you got sick, like in junior high. Was that the time period? I got sick, actually, um, the uh, the summer before my senior year in high school. Yeah, I got sick. And um, walk us through that because I think that played into where you went in your head in your life. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, to be young and sick, um, I had a very severe bacterial infection called brucellosis that I think I caught spending my summer up in Connecticut that year. Um, it's very difficult, uh, to diagnose and, you know, to be sick for, uh, you know, six, eight months before even getting diagnosed. And people will understand there are many people out there who've been sick and, un and not diagnosed or misdiagnosed or, we're told that there's nothing wrong with them, you know, and at the age of 16, when all you want to go out, all you want to do is go out and play ball with your friends. Oh, yeah, I can't imagine. It, it, it's kind of hard to uh, even imagine that, like, some doctors would be like, you're fine, just go back. Because the, the bacteria was just so rare. I think I was the first case diagnosed in 20 years. What so. did you feel like? What was the symptoms of it? Uh, uh, just the worst flu you ever had. Oh. But it never ended, you know, just. Day after Aching, day, week after joints, week, month after month, sweat, chills, yeah, that sounds terrible. Nausea, you're losing weight. You know, there's something wrong. With you. <laughs> um, so it was a relief when I was eventually hospitalized. I had a team of doctors on my case, and they diagnosed me. and And then, and then it got worse before it gets better. Like many people know, yeah. so, you know, I had to take some serious uh, antibiotics for a very long period of time, where I was convinced that I was only getting sicker. Although I was feeling sicker, my Brucella count was going way down. So I was getting better. Um, but it took years uh, to feel normal again. So that ha did it more or less you getting better happen all through your high school years? So my whole senior year in high school was shot. I was on homebound. I didn't even go to school. Can't um, imagine. Yeah, and then um, I always wanted to go to school out of state. You know, I went to school, I went to high school in Florida and then, you know, with me being sick and the doctors and I didn't want to be too far away. So I went to school in state, still five and a half hours <laughs> away from home. I went to Florida State University undergrad. Um, but I came home a lot of weekends, first two years, uh, yeah. to see doctors and try to get myself right. So, you know, you learn at an early age that you're not invincible, you know, and that, you know, like you, you, something very, very terrible could happen. You could die very quickly, but. Um, it shaped the way I thought it was my first bout of mental illness, right? Yeah. Depression, being sick. Well, you talk anxiety. about depression because, um, you talk about a couple of things, Alec, that I think is interesting. You, you really talk about your dad was a big presence in your life. Um, and that's not unusual. I, we were just talking about that, that my dad was yeah. a huge presence in my life. Uh, how did that all play out for you as you were growing up? Because as a divorced home, uh, and, and being who you were, what, what, how did that play for you? With regards to just my parents' roles? Yeah, and, and how he played into your life. and, and cause Yeah, I mean, yeah, your dad is your everything. I mean, I had an older brother also to mentor me, but he was already mentored and molded <laughs> into my body. So I, I got a double dose. Sure. You know, um, and, you know, I, because I wasn't – the sales guy and so forth at the dinner table you know i was just a listener i was an observer it was the conversation was between my brother and my father 
you know, what deals were made, how the deals were closed, what were the uh, logistics of the deal. And, you know, so I was exposed. Because they were in the car business, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My dad started in the printing business. Yeah. Before all of that just became obsolete. And then he came down here. We moved down here in Florida on a whim. He didn't have a job. He didn't have anything. And, you know, trying to make ends meet, figure out what to do. And eventually he took a car on the lot and then, you know, was promoted five times to, you know, GM. And my brother did the same thing in, you know, far less time. I mean, you know, there's sales ability in the family in the problem. DNA but I think yeah. it's I what what I think's interesting about all that is is that um it probably was in your DNA from the beginning but your dad didn't really want you to go that way I mean did, did you go into child psychology because he kind of, you could feel him pushing you into that or was that something you just naturally wanted to do and go the opposite direction of the sales um more than I want to go the opposite direction of sales you know i loathed it i i thought it sounded like hell (laughs) what is hell sometimes you know right yeah and 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 i'll be you know i'll be selling the rest of my life and on my own you know as a convicted felon you're not getting the big uh you know public company hiring you for a salary those days are those days are over right we got to be really really creative yeah um and and be able to tell your story yeah. yeah yeah And really, quite frankly, do what I love to do yeah. and what I'm best at. I mean, what made me successful, uh, you know, in sales was my ability to speak and get people to listen and follow. So now the now the question is, you know, what am I saying? Because people are going to follow and uh, it's going to be the right message, which unfortunately, that you know, that wasn't the case uh, in the into scenario. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that because let, let's, let's walk through it a little bit, Alec, because you were living a, a normal, whatever normal is, uh, you were a, a coach, a guidance counselor at school. Um, what, what gave you the launch to jump? Well, first of all, I worked at a very, I had a couple of jobs throughout my preceptorships is. As, as an intern and so forth. But my first real job as a guidance counselor was, was at an affluent private school. I was surrounded by people with great money. Great. Yeah. And um, some of them were very nice and kind and, and tried to mentor me and help me and guide me. And one specifically said, I do not see you doing this. Like, what are you going to do with your life? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was actually one of the people instrumental in getting me an interview with Eli Lilly. Um, but the, the being around the money and getting to an age where I'm no longer like 21, 22, 23, but I'm starting to be around 30 year olds and I'm seeing all the money they have and the way they talk and the way they act, the way they dress, it all started to mold me. And then being at the school and seeing these, these parents with this crazy money, um, it got to me quite frankly. Yeah. Um, makes sense. The straw that broke the camel's back was. You know, I had to monitor the carpool lane after school, and we had a guy uh, smoking a uh, cigar in a Bentley convertible. I went out there and said, hey, would you mind kindly putting the cigar out? He took another puff, blew it in my face, and, pe- and said, petty rules from petty people. Oh, you know? wow. Um, and, you know, I, I'm talking to you about that today because I'll never forget it. And yeah. it, it, it stuck it, with it. It drove me for a long, long time. Um, but now I really this point in my life i can't i can't write shit like that i just got to go through one ear and write out the other you yeah. know because it's completely counterproductive you know well and plus what you've experienced you've experienced yeah. uh, all the highs and lows so you know when somebody says that that that's it's, it's pretty uh what what do we call that i don't know it's 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 uh, it's it's apropos first of all i mean it's expected it, it is what it is yeah um, it's a stereotype you know, you know, I was talking with my girlfriend last night and, you know, I was just saying like, you know, putting myself out here like this, you know, you see, you, you're going to get comments. Oh yeah. You know, and they're not going to be positive, yeah. you know? Um, and I said to her, I said, listen, I can choose to bury my head in the sand, like, you know, the other six, which I completely respect. I have no, yeah. Qualms. you know, I don't question their, their motives, but for me, it, even though I changed and prison changed me and my experience changed me, 
in here, there's something still in here that says, Alec, that's not for you. Well, and you know? I, I, it's funny that you say that, Alec, because I had the exact same kind of conversation with my wife. We're walking the dogs. I've got my book coming out. This is a couple of years ago. And, and I said, I think I'm going to do a podcast. And she said, oh, my goodness. She said, what, right. <laughs> what are you going to do? Because Julie truly, I think, would have liked me just to be the guy that was walking the dogs in the neighborhood and, and living that silent life. Right. And, and she said, why can't you do that, Brent? And I said, I just not, I'm just, Julie, you know me. You've known me since I was 15 years old. I'm just not wired that way. I feel like I've got to go out and make a difference. And how I make a difference is different than maybe what somebody else might do. And, mm -hmm. But I can tell you this, because I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. By doing that, it's been the most liberating thing I've ever done. Because I, it takes all the power away from the person when you walk into the room. If I'm out in front of who I am and I've gone to prison and I've done what I've done and I've, I've got my whole experience, they can't use that against for me. I, I've already exposed it out there. That That's a disabler. Right. And I would rather that than wonder when I walk into there, I wonder if, I wonder if Alec knows. I wonder if, I wonder if, right. I wonder if uh, Sue knows. I wonder. Right. I, I don't like that. It's just better for me as a person. And, and it, I'm not belittling anybody that's not the other way it's just easier for me to move that way 100 percent, yeah it's uh again for me it wasn't an option yeah you know i wanted it to be an option but i quickly realized it was never going to be an option so well, i continue to fight I'll, let's go back in alec I was, let's talk about how it happened because because sure. you, you start walking into uh being Immediately, more or less, a guy that knows his way around sales, you start winning awards, um, you move through a couple of different companies, uh, big companies, we're not talking about little companies, Johnson and Johnson and, you know, big companies that you're, you're ro rolling through. And then you come to uh, your final company. Tell us about that. Well, the final company, it's just amazing how life works and everybody can relate to this. You just never know. I was out of pharmaceuticals. Yeah, I, left. I, I want to talk about that because you, you had a five-year stint. What did you do in those five years that you were I was, out? I was the director of business development uh, for sleep laboratories. So okay. We ran diagnostic tests for sleep disorders, obviously the most common one being a sleep apnea sleep and apnea. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I worked for the owner. I ran five to seven labs. Um, totally, like people are like, oh, that sounds like you're still in pharmaceuticals. Totally, totally different. Talking about a tiny company with seven labs in Florida. Um, and I was making a nice salary, no commission, no bonus, living the life that most people would really, really want to live. Um, and interestingly enough, at some point during that five-year stint, the owner said to me, you know, Medicare is cutting the reimbursement rates of, the, uh, of sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. significantly he's like i'm gonna have to like cut you, your pay significantly mm -hmm. and i'm like i get it i'm like listen you've been good to me we've been we've been through this for years you never know what's gonna happen with the medicare and the reimbursement um i said but would you be opposed to me um entertaining you know an additional job mm -hmm. you know to make to make a difference he said not at all um while that was going on, I got a call from Matt Napolitano, the vice president of marketing at Insys. He used to work with me at Cephalon. And he said, we're just launching this new drug. It's, you know, we just started. We got a, we got a VP here. We're not happy with them. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, what are we talking about? He says, right now, just be a manager in Florida. I said, that's perfect. I work in Florida. That's I where I live, jobs. right? Yeah, I, I can do both jobs at the same time. Yeah. I can I can do the pharmaceutical job, you know, literally. It, With my hands tied behind my back, All right? Pharmaceuticals is not a hard job. Yeah, and honestly, it's not a sales job. Yeah, there's there's, there's maybe two percent of every company that are true salespeople and conduct themselves accordingly. But pharmaceutical sales is the biggest cush job in the world, and people are spoiled rotten and all they do is complain why they you know, <laughs> don't make more money. Um, but I never had a lot of respect for pharmaceuticals. So I worked in it many, many years, but quite frankly, I despised everything about it. So, well, I, I, And I want to go back into Alec, because 
it, in your world where you were at at that point, are you married? Do you have kids? Are you rich because you've done all these things and, and become successful in your job? What, what's going on in your personal life? Um, before I went to Intis? Yeah. Um, I am, I'm exactly where, where someone would want to be at that age. I mean, no, I'm not rich. Um, but I'm very comfortable. Okay. Um, you know, I have a house paid for in cash, a modest house, mm -hmm. modest neighborhood. Um, you know, we drive nice cars. Yeah. You know, we go out to eat. Do we travel all over the country? Do we go spending thousands of dollars shopping? No, we don't have that kind of thing. Okay. But I had a nice life. And I had an easy job. You know, I mean, it's... And you got girls, right? You had two daughters. Is that correct? Two daughters. Okay, yeah. I have three yeah. daughters, so we're 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 very yeah. much in relation to that. My two little girls, you know, and I was home every night and wasn't traveling anymore, which I was, you know, prior sure. to that when I was in pharma. Yeah. Um, and then you know, I just literally when I talked to Matt and then I talked to the CEO and the owner, I gave them the the most arrogant, cocky questions a man could ever ask. Because I, I'm <laughs> like, have you I'm ever met Kapoor before? No. Okay. No. And I'm like, I'm not taking this job. Kapoor being the CEO of the new company. Yeah. yeah. Well, Kapoor is the executive chairman, founder of the board. Mike Babbage was the CEO. Yeah. I hadn't had either one of them. Right. But anyway, I went out there and um, I just asked them like off the wall crazy questions and they're like, well, it's your show, whatever you want to do. You know, and um, you know, I, I, I ran it accordingly and I was convinced you know, in 15 years of pharmaceuticals that if I could run the show and call my own shots, you could do it. Um, I'm going to freaking do something that nobody's ever done in that life. That's how I've always. Okay. So did you know, did you know at that time walking into that interview and then kind of doing your research about it, that the founder of the company wasn't really happy with his investment and he wanted a bigger return and, and he was looking for uh, better sales. Yeah, by that time, I also already knew that the vice president of sales, who did not know at the time, was going to be replaced. Okay. Didn't know it was going to be replaced by me, but knew that it was a possibility if I came in and performed in a you know quick period of time. Because they were after bigger sales. That's all, yeah. It's, it, was, it was go for broke, yeah. whatever it and you know, this wasn't Kapoor's first rodeo. He'd been in several different companies. It was this company that he was really looking at that he he didn't feel like the sales were performing the way that he planned on it through his ROI and his projections, and he was looking for a better way, somebody to come in and kind of save the day and, and build some new sales. And and I will say, at the beginning, his disappointment was absolutely warranted and realistic. I mean, the company was going to go under. It, it, it wasn't like we were doing okay. And you could say, hey, we just started, we're building momentum, things are projecting in the right direction. No, it was horrible. Right. Um, so I also knew that, you know. Was that part of the intrigue for you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm like, I'm just going to do a complete 180 on this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I made some crazy bold decisions, decisions that I made as a child and as a teen my whole life, and it always prospered in. But this time, you know, those crazy decisions in the big boys world, you know, specifically the federal government, right? the Department of Justice. All right. Well, let's talk about the decisions because I, I, I've, I've been all around in, 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 in doing research. I, tell us about tell us about what happened. Well, I mean, for example, my entire career in pharmaceuticals, although I had a college degree and a master's, it annoyed the hell out of me that people in pharmaceuticals seem to have their nose up in the air because <laughs> they, they had this college degree and thought that they were like in the elite of running all with elite. professionals. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and although they're right, you know, they should pat themselves on the back for their education and so forth and so on and their A's and their biochemistry degrees, which I didn't have any of that. Um, they, they're not good salespeople. Yeah, 90% of them are not good salespeople. And I came to the conclusion, you know, within a couple of months of Eli Lilly, that this isn't about helping patients and saving patients' lives. There may be a department somewhere <laughs> in the company where there's three people sitting by a desk 
maybe the guys in R and D, right? Research and development. But we all know sales drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy was planning on going public from day one. So um, I hired salespeople. If somebody came across my desk and they happen to have a college degree or a master's, great. Right. But if they couldn't stop not hiring. Um, and so I, I went above and beyond. I started to think back to the people that I went to school with my, from my child, from college. Mm-hmm. That are some of the best salespeople that I've ever seen in my life. Not because I've watched them or observed them in pharmaceuticals, but because I've seen them at a bar. Yeah. Where, you know what I mean? Such I mean, a good, really- such a good point, Alec. Cause it, yeah. you know, we had, we had four or 500 people that were salespeople and, and that person who can tell a really good story and it brings everybody in and they play the movie in their head while they're telling the story. That's a good salesperson. Yeah. I mean, I got a guy sticking out in my mind right now. This guy, this guy, you just, you, there's certain people you don't forget. Yeah. Uh, but you know, one of them, one of them I took with me, you know, I took, I, I took him, I took him to Eli Lilly with me. Yeah. Um, I took him to Seth Farm with me and then I took him to Ansys with me. He, he wanted to be a manager. Yeah. All three companies, he never made manager. But in an instance, I brought him in as a rep, I promoted him to a manager, then I promoted him again to a director. He's one of my best friends in the world. I mean, I lost a brother to death, and then I lost a brother to this because we got wrapped up in this fiasco. Um, and we'll never speak again, you mm. know, and you get that. No, You've that's been, sad. I I, 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 I feel that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it's always about the bottom line in sales. And so... I hired people with no degrees and the human resource manager who didn't even have a master's time. She's like, you don't have a college degree. I'm like, but who said you need a college degree to sell? Right. And it was kind of like, yeah, but in pharmaceuticals, that's usually the criteria. I'm like, but we don't even have a compliance department. We don't have a legal department. (laughs) You're the HR manager. You don't even have a master's. Like, (laughs) like I, so you decided to go in there and build, build the world the way that you saw it completely different than what I'd ever seen in my life. The way you wanted and it. All, yeah. And all I had to do with Kapoor was I'd say, hey, John, listen, I got to hire. There's somebody I want to hire who doesn't have a college degree. And he said, can he sell? Yeah. And I said, oh, So he understood. Uh, he understood. In that regard, he understood. Unfortunately, you know, my decisions got bolder and bolder. You but know, I, I, I want to go back to this, Alec, because yeah. one of the things I noticed, it, I can't, I can't remember where, where it came up, yeah. but, but the, um, the meetings that you guys had, and these were hardcore calling people out meetings that, you know, people are taking notes and the, the founder or the CEOs, you know, he's saying this is the way, uh, what, how, what was going through your mind in, in those type of meetings? Were you thinking, Holy shit! I gotta get this thing really rolling, or or these guys are really getting what I'm doing, and I just gotta do more of it. What what was going on in those meetings with your head? Either of the two. Um, I, I sometimes I let it get to me. First of all, like, you know, by the time I got to the meeting, I was high, stoned out of my mind because I knew I was going into the eight thirty with Kapoor, and I gotta mm-hmm. just keep my cool. Um, but. I got to a point, I mean, sales were so good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were doing amazing things. I got to a point, quite frankly, where I just didn't, there was a while where I didn't care. You know, I mean, you got to, you got to eventually begin to tune this guy out. Because you were safe. You were creating, you were winning the numbers. I was killing it. I mean, it's undebatable. You okay, know, well, let's let's talk about because when we're talking about winning the numbers, one of the things you you did is is creating this this um, world of of billions of dollars of sales. You you had this speakers bureau, and I thought one of the things that was interesting about the speakers bureau, um, and I think it was when you were with Justin talking, is is it, it wasn't easy to find these guys. You had to do some deep research, uh, really kind of go to school and and study these doctors but when you brought them in and said hey listen we're going to give you um speaker fees and you're gonna you're gonna you know prescribe drugs for us is that good you said maybe less than one out of ten would agree to that correct yeah i mean you know how many doctors are in the country i can tell you that we 
uncovered every stone, went to every city, cities that you've never even heard of in the middle of nowhere. And in my book, you know, others will say there were more, but in my book, we found 20. Well, and you, so, you but you kind of knew who that was. You know, they had they had a profile where the people were standing outside. There was, a, you know, the, the, you you found uh, the thing in the government where you could use their profile of who prescribed what, how often, all those different things uh, that were red flags for you guys in in a way for sales ways that I thought was interesting. You used data that was already there that you could profile. Well, yeah, that data is there, and it's it's it's, it's accessible to anyone. You know, we we pay for it. I think I believe it's called uh, IMS. Um, but yeah, you're right. The doctors that clearly would have risen a red flag to the government are the doctors that clearly raised a green flag to us. Um, the path of least resistance. But you know, it took even more than that. I mean, just because you go to an office where there's a line around the corner and clearly it's a pill mill doesn't mean that doctor is going to take money from you. Yeah. You know, um, even when we did our extensive research, you know, when we pre-qualified and so forth before I went out there with one of the directors or managers to have that conversation, you know, it can still blow up in your face. You could be fully prepared for an exam and literally – you know, in the middle of the dinner, he walks out or you tell him, listen, let me take care of the test. Um, I'll leave. Hey, enjoy your dinner. You know, but Alec, it wasn't a lot of money that you were getting given for these fake speaker fees. I mean, it was money, but doctors make a lot of money. But you, you know, the- yeah, you raise a good point. Um, so it's all relative and you got to take this into consideration when you're doing your analysis. Um, again, we're trying to look, we were very we're looking for divorce doctors. We're trying to hide money, to mm-hmm. pay them in a different name. Mm-hmm. We're looking for doctors who, you know, are introverts and single, and they never go out ever. Mm-hmm. And the money is just an added bonus to the camaraderie and, and the socialization and the bo- bottle service and the VIP. You got to do all of the above. Um, but also, you have to be cognizant of where this model will work. Mm -hmm. So, and because you got to, right, you only have so much money. The doctors that we're targeted were primary care physicians. Okay. That makes sense. General practitioners in internal medicine. The average salary, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but because it's been a while, I've been out of the game, but the average salary is like 150,000 for a primary care physician. Mm -hmm. If you can add another 200,000 to that. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's now a different, got, li- different lifestyle. Now, if you call on a plastic surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or, you know, even a dermatologist, for them, it's probably not worth it. Right. Right. So, um, so again, that's all part of that. All the research. Action. Yeah. Right. Even, even if oncologists prescribe pain meds for cancer, which most don't for mm-hmm. very good reasons, um, one, they don't want to give the patient the idea or the notion that they've given up on them and they're just treating them for pain. And two, they want to treat the tumor, yeah. right? But, uh, but calling on the house, again, they're in a different bracket financially. So you're right. To them, it's not a lot of money. But to the doctors we were targeting, it was fun. Okay, so talking about money, I thought it was interesting that you just volunteered when you were talking to Justin that you had this gambling thing. And I... I don't. I didn't find it anywhere else. But you talked about it, and in, in with you're talking with Justin. Did that play into anything that you like, or is that just you? That's just you play on the edge, and 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 you like to push it to the edge. And gambling is part of where your adrenaline goes. Or did that play into how you were playing your world? I mean, I think that you know, a compulsive gambler, um, you know, loves the adrenaline rush and loves the risk taking and. And gambles in all uh, aspects. Which of their sales life. is a great place to do that. It's yeah. a good place to do it. Now you know it's interesting. I gambled in some of my decisions. I thought they were calculated risk. You know, hiring people without a college degree. I, I mean, I hired an ex felon. I hired an ex felon yeah. who literally had a felony for well, They can marijuana. sell. I said to myself, <laughs> this guy, if this guy can make money selling marijuana, well, ran his own business. Exactly. Be great. Well, and, that's, and that's the thing I found fascinating. I, I had a guy, uh, Strobe, who I, I lived with for a year and a half at Leavenworth. Unbelievably 
smart on his setup, you know, with the whole string of, you know, distribution and, right. and incentives and and the whole play out of how the earn-in happened. These guys were doing it. They were operating a big uh, company that was layered. They just weren't doing it on the legal side. Right, right. I mean, and, you know, my boldest decision, which, you know, I'll never live down, was I hired a stripper, you know. Yeah. Um, I was entertaining positions in an adult entertainment club, strip club, and I met her. Of course, she sat down and did her thing and was talking. And I had just accepted the role for vice president. My manager in Chicago, I knew I was getting rid of her. She lived in Michigan. And I'm like, I'll tell you what, get dressed up tomorrow. Meet me at Starbucks. Let me see if you can sell. Look the part. Look the part yeah. and make it through the interview process without embarrassing me. Yeah. And she did it. And I gave her the job. And, you know, every night I went to Was bed, she good? Phenomenal. Well, <laughs> why is that a bad thing? If she well, was good you know, at still, if she was well, good you know, at selling, I mean, she, I you, mean you, you know, it's, it's the old story of you know the, the the strippers working her way through college and trying to get. But what she was doing, yeah. So, but but doing. I'm just saying, who's to say that a stripper can't be an incredible salesperson that that can make good money? Well, I mean, I told Kapoor she was a stripper, and he said that's fine. He's like, is she can't, done? Can't she sell? Can't she sell? So. Um, but you know, people are outraged by that. People are well, sure. About that, you know, and and I have to I have to accept that and acknowledge that. And I, you know, I guess maybe just at my age, at this point in my life, maybe you know, decisions like that, risk taking behavior, and so forth. You know, you got to grow up. You know, and um, there's a part of me who thinks that I'll never be anywhere even remotely close to as successful as I was in the past because I don't have that edge anymore to take those risks. Yeah, and make old decisions yeah um and i'm okay with that i don't want it. you know i want I, I want peace and happiness in my life i want moderation yeah i want to make a living but i don't need to be like successful like that yeah no and i i think you know when in talking to justin when he was telling me about you you you, you went and did a speaking deal at uh um usc and and i can see you being that guy that can get out and 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 convert people to understand and learn things by what you've been through. And that, that fills you up quite a bit. I've been able to do that at colleges and, and, and speak. And I, I, it feels like what I was doing as a CEO and as an owner. And, right. and that feeling is, is if you can get that back, that's a big deal. Yeah. It doesn't matter about money. It has to, has to do how, how does it make you feel? A hundred percent. And a lot of people don't understand that. I've tried to explain that to others because, even people now, it's sort of like, again, it's about money. And I'm like, no. It's not about it's money. About the, it's about the other thing yeah. that I'm doing, Well, especially you know? if you've hit, and, and, you know, you and I can back up to this. When you are sitting there and you realize that everything that you had in your life, and it was a great life, you're at a plastic chair, a bunk bed, and a locker, and you can right. adapt to that. Um when you get out, I think there's somewhat of a liberating feeling is, is I can do that. If I can do that, I can pretty much do anything. I might be a little bit scared of what you're presenting me, but I know I can do it because I've adapted to pretty much anything. Yeah. I mean, I think about that every day, you know, and just recently getting off probation, getting in my car and not, you know, having that weight lifted off my shoulders. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't get out of prison. You're not trying to brag. You know, there's nothing to brag nothing about. Nothing to brag about. Right. Although I will tell you that I do have a tremendous amount of respect, as odd as that says, for those guys that have been there for years and years. Absolutely. And Without the way in which they do their time, I mean, it's 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 just, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the little things that I picked up and learned, um, I don't condone what they did to get in there. I'm just simply saying what they're doing now is, it, it, to me, it was very impressive. Well, um, Alec, going back, because... You're building all this up. You've got the sales going. Everything's happening as you want it to happen. You're, you're, you're making a name for yourself, a bigger name for yourself. You were already a name for yourself in the business. Um, when things start coming down on you, is it a surprise or, I mean, is it a knock down the door? Holy shit, this is the FBI, or were you feeling it? I was feeling it. I had to feel it because... Um, there was an investigator reporter, this guy Roddy Boyd, um, 
that had written like a piece or two and then reached out to me. You know, I mean, I had been in pharmaceuticals before at lower levels, but, you know, was very aware that these things are pretty commonplace. Mm -hmm. I think we were the first pharmaceutical executives ever to be put, you know, in prison. Yeah, it was one Uh, of a kind, really. Yeah. So I thought that I kept trying to tell myself, I don't like this. I don't want to be a part of this. Um, but this comes with the territory. It's, it's part of it. It's part of the man. Yeah. yeah, man. You know, like, don't don't waver. Keep moving forward. Plus, you're the leader. Yeah, I'm supposed to be the leader, you know. So, uh, and I told myself that every day. And, and I did it, you know. Uh, I did it right to the end. But, uh, I even made a speech at a national sales meeting. It was quite controversial, you know, just around making sure that nobody had any questions or concerns or doubts. Mm-hmm. Um, company and, and the standing but yeah, so I, I felt it and then I read a couple articles where uh, a doctor got in trouble because his patient died um, not on substance alone but on a plethora of medications mm-hmm. substance being one of them you know and I'm like oh this can't be good mm-hmm. and then, a, then another doctor got arrested for multiple things one of which over prescribing substance so yeah, I it started closing in. So yeah, w- when it did close in, Alec, what happened? So I mean, first I got a civil attorney, you know, to handle all that. There was he was representing a, a group of us, and then my my. <laughs> I'm sure he got me. scared off immediately when he found out that it could go criminal. Yeah, he called me right away. Yeah, and he said, "I, I can't represent you anymore. You got to get a criminal attorney. Your person of interest moving to a subject any day." You know, and I'm in California doing business, you know, and at that point, you know. I well, I mean, here. a person of interest is one thing. Moving to a subject or a target, well, subject and target is pretty much the same thing. That, that, and that's what I understand. That yeah. Once you're a subject, you're pretty You much are a target, target, yeah. You're done, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and target means um, indicted. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and once yeah. indicted, you are, you are uh, cooked. tagged and cooked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I got the news in California, and I was like, listen, not feeling good. Went back to my hotel, called our in-house attorney, who we finally had one at the time, and started looking for attorneys, you know, um, and had an attorney and continued to work at Ensys for, you know, an extended period of time. What's going through your mind, though? When you think it's going criminal, is is, is uh, these things could work out? or Because you haven't been in this. What, what, what Never. Do you, what's, are, are you, like, thinking, waking up with it, going to bed with it? Um, I was, I was still sleeping and eating. So I wasn't that bad because I got to that point. Yeah. But no, I was functioning. Family? Um, what do they, they know anything? I told my wife. Okay. You know, and what's she uh, think? I mean, I, you know, I mean, we're, it's my ex-wife now, yeah. you know, it's been too much. Right. But, um, I, she, I don't think she knew what to think. She's just shaking her head. And I mean, she's been around me long enough to know that pharmaceutical companies get sued all the time and sure. pay hundreds of millions in fines. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'm sure it'll go that way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, once I got that criminal attorney thing, everything changed. And, you know, it uh, does. Once you get the criminal attorney, it gets a slippery slope. So the criminal attorney probably comes back to you and says, hey, Alec, <laughs> I went and talked to him. Here's the deal. Mm-hmm. That's usually the way it happens. Um, yeah, I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to continue an interesting. I, I wanted to be done. Yeah, I, I resigned like two or three times. Yeah, um, finally the last time, you know, we, I stayed on as a consultant for a couple months. But mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> I wanted to separate myself from them as far as I possibly could, even yeah. though I was completely, uh, you know, guilty in in the whole thing. Um, but I still just want to, I'm like, get me away from these people. Um, you know, they didn't want me to go at that point because it, even after all that, clearly sales were still, still wanting sales. Yeah. Yeah. You would think they'd be like, there's the door. Like, yeah. you know, you're the perfect scapegoat head of sales. No, they, were, they were addicted to yeah. it. No, they and needed it. We had, we had another drug that was getting launched. Okay. They said, Tell you what, just stay on for the launch. And the and drug. the drug that you guys had, it was a fentanyl spray, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. 
and, and the, it, it, all these things are very common, but people don't think of them as common. But like in the cancer uh, universe, like there's the lollipop, the fentanyl lollipop, there's all these different things. But your founder came up with a fentanyl spray that made it easy to intake and all those different things. But um, interesting how all that comes to Yeah, us. and the product, I mean, there's like six or seven products in the class. One's a nasal spray. One goes between the cheek and gum. One's the lollipop. Mm -hmm. One's underneath the tongue. It's it, it, honestly, man, it's six and one half dozen the other. Yeah. You know, you know, he he liked to think that he came out with the greatest product. Yeah, he invent, I I read about that. He is like he was the big inventor of the and and it was an invention of the spray of that. I mean, there wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm sure you could sell that because it was I one of that. It. I was, I'm, <laughs> listen, we sold it, right? Um, I mean, you don't have to actively administer the sure. tablet. You don't. Yeah, no, I read up on it. Yeah, makes you sense. Know, I get it. Kids could get a hold of a lollipop. I mean, there's something like so say. many different can, things. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can blunt any other product, but that's not the point. The point how, is, how long did it last yeah, for you, Alec? When um, they say, you know what, Alex, the the guy at the top of the chain here is selling, we're going to indict him. And how long did all this last for you? Well, I mean, I got indicted in 2016. I didn't go in until 2020. Yeah. Four years knowing you're going to prison, wondering what the heck you're going to do now, then, and after. Isn't it a weird life to live in limbo like that? I went for six years. And it's, it's I went pre-trial pre for three and yeah. it, it's a very strange and you can't talk to anybody about it unless you have somebody that, you know, you, I, maybe you talked to Jason and my, uh, and my, uh, or Justin and Michael about that. Um, but mostly you don't have anybody to talk to. You're on your own Island and, and you want to talk to people, but you don't want to freak them out either. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's a dark place. It's a very dark place. You know, I had kids. So, you know, what I, if they needed a ride somewhere, I took them for a ride. They needed to go to the mall to pick some up. They needed to go to the drugstore. They wanted to go for ice cream. Like, I just did what. How old would they have been when you were doing this in those four years, your girls? Um, like 15 and 7. Yeah. I had teenagers, so it's about the same. Oh, not 7, yeah. but teenagers, yeah. You know, and my 7-year-old tells me that she doesn't remember life. You know, before sure daddy's gone, for, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, which is horrible. It, you know, but listen, we talk about that. But you know, for me personally, um, it, this isn't about my negative experience. It's about the negative experience that I put out there. You know, based on my efforts to others, mm -hmm. um, that. Uh, you know, it's something that I have to, I got to, I got to live for, I got to live with, you know, and, but I also have to, um, no, I think you bring yeah. up, you bring up a good point, Alec, cause it's the, the, the experience that we go through is excruciatingly, it's, it's, it's a, it's an unbelievably humbling experience. Humbling, yeah. there, there's no way to get more humbled than to, uh, go through processing as a prisoner to get prisonized and enter the world that you don't know, but you have to live in. Um, how did you handle that world? Uh, I mean, I listen, when I first got there, I had to go through quarantine, you know, which was basically the shoe. Solitary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, you know, by yourself, obviously not a very um, big room, small, small, no mirror. You're supposed to get a welcome kit when you get to prison. A welcome kit is a toothbrush and a razor, and maybe a bar of soap. I can't remember. Um, I didn't get that for two weeks. They just kept forgetting. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. How long are you in uh, this solitary, uh, the SHU? I'm four. Special four housing weeks. unit is what SHU stands for, and a lot of the prisoners yeah. just call it the hole. You know, and you know, you think you're going to the minimum security, and for four years, people are telling you, oh, it's not going to be that bad. You're going to a minimum. And then, you know, the and then you're like, oh, I'm going to the shoe. Like, you know, there are people who go through their entire prison life without ever having been in solitary. Well, and Alec, I want to, I, I want, you brought up a really good point because here's the weird thing about going to prison and, and processing through, you went directly to the shoe. 
it, it, when I went in, you, you processed up the big, ugly 1879. That's how old the building is. And they process you through this basement and they put you in the cell and, and, and you just sit there. And, and you sit there for a long time. You sit there like four or five hours. And, and your mind, if you're not ever put in a situation like that, you can't really talk. About, but if you're put in a situation like that, you're like, hmm, I wonder, I wonder if this is just where they're putting me. I wonder if this right. is, I wonder if this is going to be where I'm going to be for the next three to five years here. Right. Because what in the world am I going to say to them? I'm not supposed to be here. Right. <laughs> I mean, and nobody and everybody would say that. So your mind just goes into like this weird, I started doing push ups and walking around and, you know, finally they came and got me. And then they processed me and did all the stuff that they do to you, the kind of dehumanize. And then I ended up back and going in this van down to this place that I originally thought I was supposed to go to. But for those four or five hours of thinking this could be my life for four or five years, that's a big thought. Yeah. And I had very similar thoughts, you know, and, um, you know, you don't, I mean, I spent the entire time in the shoot just thinking, I just got to get out, get out of here. Got to get out of here. That's my first goal. And when I get, when I did get to, you know, the actual minimum. What'd you do in there, Alec? That time you were in there. Yeah. I mean, I tried to do push-ups also, sit-ups. I tried to run in place. But I I didn't have any success. Like, I couldn't do it. I, I just, my brain was so Filled dull. up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I was losing my cognitive ability. I, people are in there, you know, for nine months. I don't Oh, no, they come out looking years. different. Yeah. You know, not just looking different, but they are different. They act different. You know? Yeah. I, I think that. How long were you in there? Four weeks going in, four weeks. That's a long out. time. I got a friend of mine that went in that way during your time. And um, he wasn't in that long, but he was in. Uh, I mean, he didn't do time that long, but those six to eight weeks that he had to do solitary, he said, changed his life. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, just little things. Like, I, if I'm going to bed, that door's got to be open. Mm -hmm. Like, I went to the doctor's office. They put me in the exam room, closed the door. Mm -hmm. I sat there for like 10 minutes. I got <laughs> to get out of here. <laughs> I opened the door. She said, can I help you? I said, yeah. I'm not sitting in here with the door closed. I'll sit outside in the waiting room. Yeah. You call me when the doctor's ready. It's no big deal. Yeah. 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 You know, but these little things that you never even thought of all of a sudden are coming to fruition and you're like, Oh yeah, there's been some change. Yeah. And I, I, I had the same thing happen with Alec. We had a dog that uh my 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 uh, Stanley, who's a black lab, he ate some latex gloves and we had to cut it out of him and we went into that small little room there and we had to wait forever. And I told right. Julie, I said, I don't feel good in here. This, this, really? isn't, this isn't feeling right. This is this little yeah. room that we're cl closed in on. I've, I've got this feeling that I got to get out of here. Yeah. I didn't have and that before. You, right. And when you're the type of guy that doesn't know if you have it or you don't, and all of a sudden you're in a cell and, um, you know, you don't know what time it is. Yeah. You only know, you know, by the meals and breakfast comes. Like, I don't know, well, the weird thing is, Alec, you were the guy calling the shots. So it's that's why I say it's so hu uh, humbling is that you go from a world of calling the shots, going through the world of being indicted. You, you, I mean, it levels down. But once you get to that point, you realize yeah. you don't have any control anymore. And that's an adjustment into a whole new world. You Once you entered into your world of being in the prison, how did you adapt and adjust to that? What was it like? I, I I mean, all things considered, I adapted pretty good. I mean, honestly, I felt like I felt like I died and went to heaven when I got out of shower. I bet. That was the only positive. All of a sudden, I'm walking around. People, <laughs> I hear voices. Yeah. I feel normal again. Yeah. Like you know, um, you know, initially, you know, I just pretty much spent all my time, you know, on my bed, you know, until, until I got my job. And um, what kind know, of job did you do? Um, I worked outside, did gardening and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it was hot as hell. Um, Where were you? But, uh, Where'd you go? Uh, Miami. 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 Oh, it would have been hot as hell, yeah. Uh, you know. Um, but uh, 
you know, and then one guy gave me a radio and, you know, you're told before you go into prison, don't take anything from anybody. Yeah. And I said no to the guy like, <laughs> and, and he was just enormous, man. Like yeah. He, there's two guys like in every dorm that kind of run it. You know that. Yeah. He was one of the two guys. He's like, he's like, listen, man. He's like, it's okay. Take it. You know, Take that that is such bad advice because once you get in there, you realize that there's really good people that want to help you. I mean, I had big Watson that was next to me. And he said, I'm giving you these shower shoes because I don't want a side bunkie that smells. And I didn't right. even know what, how important those shower shoes were at the time he gave them to me, the very first hour I was there. You and, too. you know, I was told that too, that don't take anything. People are going to yeah. use you. Man, there are so many guys that just want you to get through because you're living in their world. They identify with you coming in new. I mean, one of the things they do do is they do look at the new guy coming in and size him up and see if he's, you know, yeah. Who he is. I mean, I think it's just literally within the first hour, I had a pair of sweatpants, I had a sweatshirt. Big deal. I had sneakers. They were like three sizes too big, but yeah. I was so freaking happy. <laughs> Mine were too uh, small. <laughs> yeah, you know. I don't know which is better. Yeah. And it was like three months before I could finally, you know, get sneakers at the commissary. Yeah. It's like, you know, the craziest things, little things that you don't even think about, adding up your grocery list manually. Well, you had to be, t yeah, actually, to me, I had to be shown how to do that because it was, I, I, to me, uh, my mind was just like scrambled. Like, I, I'm, I'm confused. How do you fill this thing out? Me too. You know, and again, after coming out of solitary, um, I was having a hard time just getting my thoughts together and thinking. I, the whole time I was solitary, they give you that long code for your phone. I kept trying to memorize it, no matter what I did, I couldn't memorize it. Yeah. I mean, it just, your brain really... Well, look, I, I want to explain that, because that, that is, uh, one of the things that happens, like when you have in, in prison, you can go to a computer and you put your thumb on the computer, and that's actually easier, because it'll, like, let you in to, to be able to type. And I think it's like five cents a minute. But when you make a call, you have to rattle off your, I think it's a pack number is what they call it. yeah. yeah. And and when you're new, um, that's a big deal because this pack number is like comes out of a computer and you've got to recite that thing before you can ever talk to anybody on the outside world. And I remember thinking when I first got there, probably you too, Alec, is I got to figure this stuff out. I got, I want to talk to the outside world. I want to be, but I, I, I've got to figure it out because it's not easy. Right. You know, you got to send an email, you got to send the phone, but I'm telling you, I, the, the weeks while I was in there, I couldn't get that number down. I'm like, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I can't. I can't remember one number. I was a long number. It is a long number. It is a long number. But I'll it's do like, you one better. I couldn't. When they asked me in the gate in this big cage I was in, going into this ugly looking prison to be processed, they asked me my social security number. I couldn't remember it, and they said, can you, "You can't. You can't fucking remember your social security." I said, "I, I, 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 I don't think I can. <laughs> I don't really yeah. think I can." Yeah. Oh, I mean, listen. I remember when I when I first got there, I got processed. He's walking me over. He goes, you know where you're going? I said, you know, sir, I was told I'm going to the minimum. He goes, you are. He's like, but you're going, you're going to the shoe first. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the sweat already started coming down. Yeah. Then, he, then he says to me, hey, man, can you fight? So I tried to give him the politically correct answer. And I said, you know, I think I can handle myself. I said, but my goal here is to, you know, avoid, sure. uh, you know, confrontation. Any confrontation, whatsoever. exactly right. He goes, yeah, that's good, but it'd be better if you could fight. You know? <laughs> so it's just like, you know, that's the mentality. Oh, no, it scares you. It's a scary thoughts because you're entering yeah. into a, you're in a, you're entering into an unknown world, um, and and your world was different than my world because you went into a COVID world, and um, there's never a good time to go into prison. But I think the worst time to go into prison in the United States is in COVID because everybody got locked down. Whether you were yeah. in prison or not, in prison, you lock people down in prison and converge that world into a smaller world. That's that's a whole different way to do prison. Yeah. What did you start thinking, Alec, when you were getting close to the door? You're you're getting close to getting out. Um, what are you thinking about reentry? What was I thinking about reentry? Um, I mean, I knew I had the halfway house ahead of me. You yeah. know, I had nine months in the halfway house. There's nothing good about the halfway house either. And sometimes, some good, people. But, but for me, a thousand times better than being in prison. Because you're out. You're out of work. You come home. You, 
come home, you're tired, you grab your phone, you sit in your bed, you watch a movie. You know, this little iPhone, it felt like I was watching the biggest screen. Oh, yeah. Screen. Different world. Yeah. Right. Um, so for me, you know, I felt like the halfway house was going to be another hurdle that I had to jump over. So I wasn't thinking a whole lot about my career and finances. I, I was thinking, okay, this is the next hurdle, but this is a positive step. And it's going to be better. And it was. Mm -hmm. And then I got moved to home confinement for three months. So even at home, I felt like I really tried hard not to bite off more than I can chew for a while. Mm -hmm. what, what year was it that you got into home confinement? Uh, 2021. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, I, you know, at this point right now where I'm at, I'm very, very, uh, ready to go. Very, very motivated. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I've you know, it's been years. Yeah. You know, and thank God. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, th I think eventually you go through a 10 year span. Um, mm -hmm. that's the way I looked at it. I, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I was 40 when it happened. I was 50 when I came out. Um, it took a little bit of while for the reentry because you, you just, what you, I mean, you, you, you talked about it, you know, just being in certain situations, it's, it's, a, it feels a little bit different. And the weird thing about Alec, I mean, you and I are just sitting here talking about this, but, um, it's weird because you can't really talk too much to people about it because they think that you should be so excited about being out of prison and you are, it's like coming down as a five-year-old seeing all your toys times a thousand, but you've got all these other things running through your mind. How am I fitting back into the family? Who's paying, who's paying the bills? How do I get a job? Am I going to get a, how are my family? How's my friends treating me? How's this and that and that you've got all these things just like running through and it's like jumping into a moving car but on the outside, you're trying to act like I'm just Brent. Back. Just act at, I'm back. But yeah, yeah. inside, you're like, man, I hope I can fit it back into all this because I feel a little bit like I got some sea legs here. 100%. And you're not, at least for me, you're not the same person. No, and you can't be the same person because right. it is who you are now. It's who you are now. So you have to adjust to your new self and then figure out how that's going to play into all of the elements that you just talked about. I mean, yeah, my kids need me, Yeah, you know, um, I didn't make money for a while and my excuse is I'm not going to not make, I need to support, you know, my responsibilities don't go away. Um, but you're right. Everybody. I mean, I, I even some really good friends, like they don't want to hear you. You know, so you don't complain. You don't complain. You know, you just you just do what you got to do. I mean, for me, the four years after I was indicted before going to the prison, if that wasn't walking through the motions with a smile on my face, oh like, yeah, you know, if I could do that, then now, you know, I had a good I, friend of mine that had gone through the same thing that I was going through, and he was telling me as I was going through it advice, and he said, "Brent, you you suit up, show up, and shut up." <laughs> He said, suiting up means that you're there. Um, showing up means it must not be as bad as everybody thinks. And you shut up because they don't want to hear about your stuff. Yeah, that's strong. I like it. But it was it was really strong. It was like strong medicine because you, you don't think that. But I, I think in, in essence, it kind of works. Um, and, you're, you know, people obviously are close to you. You can talk to them about whatever. But in the general sense. So Alec, where you are now, and you you haven't been somebody that's been um, hidden. You're out. You're about, and you're in your. What's uh, what's your world like now? Um, it's a hybrid. <laughs> you know, I've got a girlfriend. Uh, we live together. You know, that's really nice. You yeah, know, just to be able to work all day have something to come home to yep um my, my two kids um but i work a I work a you know a nine to five six day a week job uh in a cubicle mm -hmm. you know phone sales um I'm, i make a good living i'm very you know i can't i'm sure you're good at that because i'm good at it you know um i mean god gave me a couple of gifts you know there's a lot, I got a lot of weaknesses, but there's a couple of things that i'm good at well and i know? think and, and i think that you bring up a good point too you can put a sales guy in a cubicle, but if he has really good sales experience, 
he can outlap anybody around. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about making phone calls. And I said, you know, I said, if you're making a cold call, I said, apologize to him for first. And I said, they said, well, I don't understand what you're saying, Brent. I said, well, I said, it's kind of like this. I said, when I was 15 years old, I, they were, I was told by my dad, I need to make these appointments for these salespeople. So I would call and I'd say, hey, Alec, this is Brent Cassidy. I'm calling from Pennington Funeral Home. I want to apologize to you. I was supposed to get some information out to you yesterday and just ran out of time. What would be a good time to get that to you? So I never asked them if it was okay to bring the information by. I apologized yeah. to them that, and it confused them. It totally confused them. So I'm late yeah. now. But yeah, once yeah. You, my, my point is, Alec, is that you can't confuse a good sales guy because a good sales guy always has it in his brain of what works. You just put it, parachute him down and, and he will figure out the lay of the land because, you know, certain things work. Yeah, you have to be back. You have to be a chameleon. You have to mirror. You have to understand these people's social style, what they think. I mean, my experience through the years of having to, you know, people say clothes is the most important part of sales, but for me, I'm not, I'm not debating that, but for me, targeting is right there with it mm -hmm. because the way I do my business and I've done it my whole life, 98% of my time, money and resources goes to 2% of my customers. Mm. So that 80, 20 rule has never applied. No, you have Again, a 2% rule. It's the extremist of it. I know I'm going to get more from that 2% if I do it right than I'll ever get from 20%. But if I choose the wrong 2%, then I, I kill myself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I like where you're at right now. And, um, and I, I like that you're getting out and, 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 you know, I don't know what this, uh, pain hustles is going to be, but I think, you know, Alec, the more that you can get out and tell your story, be the person you are, that you're a real person that went through this and how you went through it is a good thing. Um, yeah, I'm glad you touched on that. I mean, you know, the movie's coming out. I heard for years, oh, they might make a movie on the Insta story. Um, nine times out of ten, those never come to fruition. So I'm thinking I'm not worried. <laughs> this really happened. Um, yeah. I mean, this guy, Evan Hughes, is a phenomenal author. He wrote the book on the story. Yeah. Um, I worked extensively with him. I mean, nothing, hours and hours, days and days. Um, and he, you know, he wrote an accurate story. You know, but the movie, it, it's a movie. It's a movie. Um, yeah. And they made it crystal clear to him that... Uh, I got to yeah, ask you though, Alec, the the Emily Blunt person that they kind of the, it's in the description is that a yeah. real person that came through? Is a female that was having a hard I time? Think, and, I think she's a combination of a few. Okay. You know, and I think that uh, I think that the the lead Chris Evans is also a, a combination of of a few of the key players. Yeah. So I there'll be parts where I'll watch and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's, a, that's I can kind of see me in that. <laughs> and then, and, and there'll be other parts where I'll be like, no yeah, way. Yeah. hundred percent. Not me in any way, shape or form. Yeah. yeah. It's loosely based on the answers film. Um, but you know, the fact that they are even acknowledging that, uh, you know, it, it, it concerns me because the message that I'm trying to get out there is the exact opposite message of what that movie will, uh, entail. But again, it's a movie. I it's don't a movie. Them. Their job is, put people in seats and keep them in seats. I've got to keep that in perspective and just continue to go on with my life. You and know? you'll survive it um, because of what you're doing, how you're doing it. And people want to listen to you, Alec. You know, th th you've got a story to tell, uh, fascinating story to tell. And and you have a lot of life experience to to share to people. And I, I um, as far as people getting a – well, I want to ask you too before I get to that um, – Going through what you've gone through, living what you've lived, what do you think is your biggest takeaway from where you sit right now? It could be a couple of different things, too. Biggest takeaway is, you know, it is, uh, it is so counterproductive to try to spend your energy pleasing others. That's huge. You know? Um you're you want to be good to others yeah right? you want to take care of them. You want, especially the people that love you but pleasing others that's a character flaw that that's an that's a, an insinuation of something that you're lacking mm -hmm. right and you're trying to enabling up for that right 
by pleasing others and getting it from somebody else when it's got to come from within. You got to fill yourself you know? up. And if you have that in your confidence, you know, the decisions you make will be yours and yours alone. At least you know that they won't be influenced by anybody else. I, I think that is a huge life lesson. You got to fill yourself up thinking you're going to get your, your filled up from other people. Um, right. Yeah, no, I, I think good point. Good advice. Alec, if people want to get a hold of you, I've got um, Limitless. Uh, let's see what I just do with that. That's okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, limit, Limitless at A. Berlikoff, and that's B U R L A K O F F dot com. Um, yep. And, and I, I, mean, I think you're doing coaching, right? Yeah, I do coaching. Um, I, I'm available. I work long hours. I mean, all weekends, six to nine every night. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of consulting jobs that I like. Um, I like to take the smaller companies. I don't want a huge sales force. Yeah. Is that's going to bring me back? To <laughs> You've been in that for. world, right? I'm looking for like a, five, a sales force of like five. Yeah, build sales. them up. Yeah, something magical you can really keep your keep your eye on. Um, and then you know, I, I love the speaking. You know, um, for me, that's like what we talked about earlier in the conversation. You know, the opportunity to get up there and, and demand attention and create action and uh, influence others. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that, that's the. Looking at your life, that's one of the things that you've done, Alec, and that's what you're going to be seeing you do now is, is, is taking action. Don't be afraid to try. Take action with it, and, and things happen with that. You know, perfection is never born. You just evolve, and uh, just taking action is where you got to start. Uh, let's see. So the, I want to send people to your book, too, Selling Hard Lessons Learned, Amazon. Um, hey, if you want another book, I've got one. So Nightmare Success, you can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, for everybody, if you got anything out of this, and I know you did, please go to Spotify, leave a review. Uh, Apple, leave a review. It puts the uh, show on steroids. I don't know what they do with the algorithm. When those reviews hit, they, they just keep pushing them up. Um, BrentCassie.com, check me out there. got all my stuff. Uh, my daughter, Courtney, keeps me up to date uh, and, and updating that. I wish I was smart enough to do it myself. And um, as I used to say uh, when I was writing my emails back and forth from prison, stay strong. I'll do the same. Alec, really appreciate you today, man. My pleasure, Brent. I really enjoyed the conversation. It was a pleasure. Me too. Nightmare success in and out. <laughs>